Good afternoon or good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to welcome you all. Um, as Felice mentioned, uh, I teach the Heart to Heart class, which is a very popular class that's offered right here through Stanford Children's Health. Um, we offer classes for girls and their significant female uh, people in their lives. There's also classes for boys. And these are for children at puberty age, 10, 11, and 12. And so that's what I'm usually doing when I'm here. But tonight, um, I was invited to speak about something else that I'm very passionate about, which is uh, the frame, this framework that um, some of you may be familiar with called the Developmental Asset Framework. And it's simply a way to think about how children grow up and how communities, families, parents might interact with those kids. And so the goal tonight is to um, talk about, uh, to actually, I'm just going to kind of walk you through what the framework is and where the data came from in the hopes that that'll really make sense to you. Um, we're going to talk about how as children develop these assets in their lives, then they are much more likely, as the data shows us, to participate in thriving behaviors and much less likely to participate in risk-taking behaviors. To me, it's all pretty common sense. I hope you'll agree with me after we go through some of the data and the information behind this framework. The last thing, and maybe the most important thing, is that we're going to kind of look through, look at some parenting strategies. Or if some of you are here and <clears throat> your interaction with kids is not necessarily related to parenting, but something else, it will also be applicable to that. Because we'll be talking about different roles that people have in your kids' lives. Um, I'm a parent of two. And uh, there are girls, and they're 11 and 15 currently. So um, uh, we are through many developmental stages in our house, have more developmental stages to come. And um, I'm also an educator in classrooms. And that's largely been middle school. And um, I'm also out in the community among nonprofit health and child-related adults, trying to build our community so that we're more welcoming, receptive, and healthy for our kids to thrive in. And that is throughout Santa Clara County. I'm curious to know a little bit about you all. So um, if you're here because your life involves a great deal of interaction with an elementary school kid. Could you just raise your hand so I can see if that's your passion? And what about middle schoolers? Is anybody here because you've got middle schoolers in your life? And what about high schoolers so, and high schoolers? 11 and 15. Yeah. Boys. Oh, yeah. check that out right there. So you've got, you're right in the middle of those. And then preschoolers. Right. on a unit where we have a whole spectrum, and my job is to be present and engaging. Right. And of course, the asset. Right. So the information we're going to share tonight hopefully will be transferable for you in any place where you encounter kids, be it professional, be it at home, be it in the classroom, what have you, um, largely school age. So um, how many of you are familiar with developmental assets? If you've heard that term, you just raise your hand because I just want to know. OK, so that's good to know. Um, the first thing I want to ask you to do is this. So I want you to think for a minute back to your own childhood. Pick a time that is memorable for you where you have some pretty strong memories. And what I want you to think about are who or what had a positive impact on your life during that time period? Who or what made a positive difference in your life during that period? So I want you to crystallize that, get it in your mind. A who or a what made a positive difference for you at a point in your childhood? Think about that for 20 seconds and focus on it. Make sure it's clear, it's a memory that's clear. OK, so I hope somebody's willing to share what came to your mind. Anybody, if you just raise your hand, toss it out. Yeah. My father. Your father. Excellent. My high school football coach. High school football coach. Who else? What kind of things came to mind? My grandmother yeah. and my two great aunts who all lived in the same household, the positiveness of their life and their complete acceptance and support. Mm -hmm. So attention, their positive focus and attention when we 
them. Right, grandmother and great aunts in, a, in the home with their positive support. Others, something we haven't mentioned. Anybody has something different than those? Parents, grandparents, coach? Anybody else? Often I hear um, music teachers, especially when I ask kids or teenagers as they're aging out of childhood, I'll hear um, my experience in the band. Um, I might hear, I've done talks like this to parents who have kids in juvenile hall. I've done talks like this to kids in juvenile hall. I've done talks like this with kids and parents outside in other arenas. I hear, you know, my social worker, my probation officer, um, my teacher, time and again, my teacher, my fifth grade teacher, my seventh grade teacher. Teachers often figure prominently. Okay, so bear that in mind. We're gonna be talking about, we're gonna be coming to that, back to that in a moment. So when, I'm gonna define developmental assets. So for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm gonna start off with a generic definition that we use with people of all ages. The positive values, relationships, and experiences that we know through research youth need to thrive. The framework that we call developmental assets was developed by the Search Institute. This is a research organization based in the Midwest. 50 years ago, the Search Institute began to look around and ask itself and began to search through reams of data around what are the fundamental elements that children need to succeed and thrive in life. Not only did they begin surveying fields of study related to children, including education, medicine, psychology, et cetera, but they developed a survey tool and began asking youth themselves, what's making a difference in your life? By 1990, the Search Institute had a rigorous scientific-based survey that they began to issue all through North America to teenagers in high school about their lives, what they had, what allowed them to thrive, what were their risk behaviors, and what were they doing in their life that felt positive. A few years after that, they developed a survey tool for elementary and middle schoolers. Now, 20 years later, the Search Institute has amassed a data set of four million surveys, fourth grade through 12th, children and youth's own voices on a rigorous scientifically tested survey tool that tells us what elements they have in their lives how many of them they have, and how much do they feel like they are thriving and also taking risks that could be dangerous or harmful to them. So there's a list of these assets. And I hope that each of you grabbed one as you came in. 41 developmental assets. Now, I want you to get used to this list we're going to be referring to this for the rest of the evening so it should be getting crumpled and used and referred to and written on etc so this is what the framework looks like and these are the 41 elements that the search institute has identified that if children and youth have a lot of them they're going to do better in life and grow up to be successful and contributing adults if children and youth only have a few of these, there's a great likelihood that they're gonna encounter a lot of challenges and struggles in their lives. It's as simple as that. I view this list as common sense, and I hope you will too. And one of the reasons I say that is because if you think about the idea that you just had in your head of what or who generated a positive experience or helped you in childhood, you can find that element on this list. So for example, if you said father, then you go to asset number one. I know these are small, I hope you can read it. Family support. Family life provides high levels of love and support. If you said grandmother or great aunt, 
Look at asset number one, family support. If you said high school football coach, then go right to asset number three, other adult relationships. Child receives support from adults other than his or her parents. If you were thinking high school football coach, you might also go down to asset number 14, adult role models. Parents and other adults in the child's family, as well as non-family adults, model positive and responsible behavior. To me, that's, this is common sense. This is what you yourselves have experienced. If you thought, for example, some of the other things I was mentioning, a, a young person you once told me, well, being in the high school band changed my life. Well, then you can go down to asset number 17, creative activities. Child participates in music, art, drama, or creative activities two or more times a week. So the asset list, if you think about it, I am going to wager that whatever came to your mind that had a positive aspect on your own personal childhood, you can link directly to one of these 41 elements. And that's, to me, part of the beauty of this framework. Um, I'll tell you a couple of the things about the list. So as you can see, they're divided in half. The first 20 being referred to as external assets. So external assets are the assets that are provided to our children by the outside world, by us, by the, the adults in their lives, by their families, their parents, their community. If they're providing service to others in the community, do they feel safe? Do they feel like their neighborhoods are caring and safe? Is their school a caring place? Do they feel welcome there? Do they feel cared about there? These are all the external factors in our kids' lives that impact how strong they are inside emotionally and how well able they will be to thrive. If you look at the second half, which we call the internal assets, these are the assets then that get built from inside. So the child's own commitment to learning assets 21 through 25, is the child motivated to achieve in school? Is the child engaged in her learning? Is the child doing her homework? Does she feel bonded to her school? Does she read for pleasure? These are all the internal assets that are coming from inside. Her, his or her own values, his or her own, own social competencies or skills that he or she has to deal with the world, and finally, his or her own identity. How do I see myself? Do I feel like a powerful person? Can I make change on behalf of myself? Do I have a sense of purpose in this world? Do I think my future's looking bright? Those are all part of the internal assets. Now, what I'd like you to do is take a few minutes with the list, take a pen or a pencil, and just circle for yourself the assets that you believe you had when you were growing up. Which of these do you believe you had when you were growing up? And I want you to take a couple minutes and circle the ones that you agree you have. Okay, so hopefully the list seems rather familiar and you found some things on here that you could relate to. Did you see anything surprising about the list and or does it pretty much make sense? If it makes sense, nod. In this day and time, in our urban nature, in our busy lives, sometimes neighborhoods lose their emphasis. Um, however, there is still very much a feeling, especially around a school or a court or a street or an apartment complex, the children and youth themselves feel a sense of neighborhood. And it's definitely still present in this country, although for many of us, when we're driving here to and fro, and the kids over here for one activity, and the kids over there for school, and we live in this home in this neighborhood, sometimes it has relevance. Many times it has relevance for the kids themselves. Sometimes it might not feel so much now. The, you'll notice on the asset list that there are 41. There's a little asterisk on the 41st asset. The asterisk explains that our local developmental asset coalition here in the Bay Area, when, 
when the developmental asset framework was first introduced to several many uh, youth leaders in the Bay Area. The youth leaders in the Bay Area took the survey. We surveyed a bunch of youth here. They went around and talked to uh, the leaders of the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Clubs and multiple churches and lots of school districts. And the feedback was when the list was first presented and there were only 40, the feedback was that here in the Bay Area, if this framework is going to work for us, there needs to be some emphasis in the list on cultural identity for our kids. So the Bay Area, when it welcomed the developmental asset framework uh, to be used throughout our schools and our churches and our YMCAs here, which it is, uh, kind of demanded that we add our own 40, 41st asset called positive cultural identity. We don't have data on that asset because it's not part of the survey that millions of kids take on a regular basis throughout North America. However, when we talk about developmental assets, certainly here in our communities, we all always talk about asset 41. On some of my slides, you will only see data on 40 assets, not 41. So that's um, a footnote. Now. Another way to think about the asset framework is to think about it um, akin to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For those of you who are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you would know that Maslow in the 1940s was a social scientist who came up with a theory that uh, people were motivated to meet their needs. And first and foremost, people were motivated to meet their physiological needs. Once they had their physiological needs for food and shelter met, then they were motivated to meet their safety needs. And so once they had their safety needs met of being, um, uh, being free from danger and violence, then they went on to have their social, wanting to fill social needs, having community, family, loved ones, kin. Once those needs are met, then Maslow theorizes that then we go on to have our own internal needs for esteem met, once our internal needs for esteem are met and we have all these things in place in our lives, then he theorized we reach a point of self-actualization. We are fully ready and determined to uh, take advantage of all that life offers and be our largest true selves. So in terms of the asset framework then, we have come up with another way to think about these 40 developmental assets or 41 developmental assets in terms of a of a hierarchy, and here's kind of how that works. At the bottom of the base, the foundational level of the assets will be the external assets that I talked about before. This is the foundation for our kids as they begin to grow and thrive. We, as a community and a family, have the most influence on our kids and the environment in which they function. So you see the support assets, the empowerment assets, et cetera. Once a child has the external assets this idea presents, then they can go on to build their own internal assets. They'll internalize the values that they're witnessing around them, and that will come from the strong adult role models in their lives, that will come from the strong family support that they're getting among their external assets, and that will come from their experiences. Once they develop the internal assets, the values and the um, competencies, et cetera, then they will go on to achieve their thriving indicators. Some of the thriving indicators that might be difficult to read are that the child values helping others and engages in helping others. The child values diversity. The child maintains his or her good health and participates in healthy behaviors. The child succeeds in school, shows leadership, resists danger, delays gratification. In other words, knows how to save or put off something to have something better later, and is able to overcome adversity. Once the thriving indicators are in place, on top of the foundation, finally we reach resiliency. As you all are aware, I'm sure, resiliency is where our kids when they meet up an obstacle, they meet up with a struggle, they can get through it. They have the resources, they have the skills to overcome that adversity and bounce back. They know where to get help. They can meet up with a problem or struggle and work their way through it. So 
this is a play off of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs that, um, that is a, just a different way of thinking about it as you start to sort of understand this framework better and how it might apply to you. So one, another way that we kind of refer to the building assets is that we create thousands of moments in time where children and youth feel valued, respected, and known. And I, if you think about it, you'll know what those are. When an adult walks through a schoolyard and the kids are out there playing, the adult can be on her cell phone like this, or the adult can be walking through the schoolyard saying, hey, Erica, how's it going? Joshua, nice backpack today. Those are the thousands of moments where children and youth feel valued, respected, and known. It can happen on a blacktop. It can happen in the grocery store. A colleague of mine who teaches these classes talks about a time when she went through the grocery store and her bagger, the girl that was putting her groceries in her bag, was um, doing so in a very staid and unresponsive way, like a machine, with hair falling down into her eyes and just putting the groceries in the bag with no facial expression. When this woman finished checking out, she looked at the girl, and the girl had a name tag on, and she said, hey, Sonia, how are you today? And the girl said, it's OK. And she said, hey, would you take my bags out to the car with me? And my colleague then walked, the girl walked with her out with the car, out to the car, and she engaged in a conversation with this girl, who ended up revealing at the end of the conversation, so just two minutes, that she was pregnant unexpectedly, and her low-paying job had been kicked out of the house by her family, had nowhere to go. That started a relationship between my colleague and this girl that then lasted several years, where this colleague put out a few calls to her well-connected friends and got this girl the help that she needed. And this girl went on to thrive. But that was another one of those moments where that young person, for the first time that day, maybe that month, maybe that year, felt valued, respected, and known because someone looked her in the eye and asked her a question in the checkout stand. So I have up here a tower of blocks similar to a Jenga game. Each one, there's 41 of them. Each one has an asset on it. Now, you can imagine, we'd love for our kids to have 41 assets, but most of them don't. And some of them have very few. Now, you can imagine what happens when a child has fewer assets. So this child just lost this asset. What is it? Okay, and there's another one. So number 19, religious community. Child attends religious programs or services one or more times per week. Okay, um, what's your name, Jeff? Would you go pull one? It's not a test, Jeff, just <laughs> <laughs> whatever you can grab. Nice. And what does it say? Number 24, bonding to school. Child cares about teachers and other adults at school. OK, thanks. So we go on and on. I'll show you some data soon about how many assets our kids here in Santa Clara County have based on the surveys we've done here. But you can see what's going to happen when the number of assets drops, right? What's going to happen if we take out 10 more, 20 more maybe? As some of you might be Jenga experts out there. It's going to tumble, right? It's going to encounter, this tower is going to fall. This tower is going to encounter some tough times. And that's exactly what happens to our kids as their asset levels fall. The point here is the more assets, the better. Again, common sense. You look at that list. If my kid has all these things, my kid's going to do pretty darn well. And you can count on that. Then the data supports that. So here's what we know. Here's kind of how we've separated it out. Youth with low levels of assets engage in significantly more risk factors. 
than youth with high levels. The Search Institute has identified a continuum of healthy development based on these asset levels. A child with zero to 10, not surprisingly, is gonna be very at risk for dangerous behaviors and harm to self. A child with 11 to 20 is vulnerable, meaning that we as a community, we wanna pay attention to these kids as we do with the at-risk kids and maybe set up some extra supports, check in with those kids. Adequate 21 to 30, that's generally around the 20s where you're gonna see most of our kids in this valley are adequate. This kid's doing okay, is probably gonna be fine. This kid's probably gonna reach have a lot of thriving indicators, probably gonna reach some degree of resiliency. But thriving and optimal, the kids where we really want our kids to be is between 31 and 40 assets. The surveys that we administer throughout the country and here in Silicon Valley are surveys that measure the number of assets our kids have. And here's what we found. The green bar is our kids here in Santa Clara County. The blue bar is the national average based on several million surveys in the United States. So the average from fourth through 12th grade in the country is 21 assets in Santa Clara County and 18.6 across the country. Average number of assets, all ages. As you move to fifth grade, that's where the highest level of assets, the survey isn't given any younger than fourth. As you can imagine, each child is reading the survey. They're very developmentally appropriate, but it's, it's difficult to survey kids under the age of nine. So we start in fourth grade with a, a survey designed for fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. It's called Me and My World. And this is what we find. Average in Santa Clara County, 26.4. Pretty good, adequate close to 30, doing pretty well. By the time our kids get to seventh grade, we're down to 22.5 in our valley. Moving on to ninth, 20.8, and then down again by 11th grade. Now in Santa Clara County, 19.7. We've got some vulnerable kids. Our average is below 20, something to pay attention to. We also know that um, as kids are seeking their independence, as they're moving towards teenagerness, they are taking more risks. They are out there thinking for themselves, maybe making mistakes, maybe losing friendships, maybe changing peer groups. That's a kind of a natural thing, but we're not, those of us in the field aren't always very happy with this downslope, although it's been repeated time and again through national and international surveys. Okay. So it, another way to look at it, again, I'm gonna present the data in different ways. But here what you can see, if we just look at, if we group at risk and vulnerable, and we group adequate and optimal, what we can say about Santa Clara County, and this is from a 2011 survey of 38,000 fourth through 12th graders in this valley, that 22 of our youth are at risk or vulnerable, so that's yellow and red pieces of the pie, and 36% 36% of our youth are thriving. We're very happy about that. Uh, the 41 is adequate. And then when we move on to the high, middle and high schoolers, you can see how that changes. Only 12% are up above 31 assets and a higher number of youth, 49 at risk or vulnerable in this valley by the time they get to middle and high school. Okay, are there any questions so far? Before I move on to the next piece, I'm going to charge on. Yes? Is there any uh, uh, differentiation made with uh, ethnic background? Yes. So the survey takes all of that into account. And what we can say most certainly is that regardless of family income, regardless of family structure, and regardless of ethnic background, the more assets a child has, the more likely they are to thrive. The fewer assets a child has, the more likely they are to be engaging in risk behaviors and harmful behaviors. Are there statistically significant differences in the number of assets? It varies widely. And there's no definitive data that says that any type of child from any type of background is likely to have more assets than another. Yeah? Are there any individual towns or cities for which data are available that show markedly 
higher asset development than the average in the country or the state or, or this part of California? There are a lot of people working on that. And one of the reasons why, um, so this is a snapshot in time. So when a city undertakes some, thinks it's special, undertakes its own calculation, maybe undertakes its own programs, and it tries to show improvement, that's a challenge because this data is a snapshot in time. So the kid you're working with in seventh grade, if you think you have 22 average asset level, you're looking for 30, you take the, you do some things, you make your community better, things come together, you survey again, and you're at 30 average, you've probably surveyed different kids. It's just a snapshot in time. So that's one point I just want to make is that it's people, um, there have not been communities that I know of that have waved the banner and said, woohoo, we're awesome. You know, we're at 30, we're at 35. I don't know of any community, and they do. They're, they're citywide campaigns to take the survey and to raise community awareness throughout this country. And I don't know of one that is waving a flag saying, we're awesome and this is a great community. All our kids are at 30. Yeah. So with, looking at the chart, it, it almost seems like that they're, the younger kids have higher asset counts. And as they get older, they lose them. Is that? Yes. That, so, and how is that happening? Is it a reinforcement process? Or? Right. So the national data and the local data show that younger kids have more assets and older kids drop off and that has been consistent over time and consistent uh, across cities counties and states it's a natural developmental trajectory for our kids that they will be out in the world more testing boundaries taking steps on their own as they age falling getting back up etc and experimenting with peer relationships leaving their adults behind maybe minimizing family support for a certain amount of time. That's all a natural developmental cycle, but it also is reflected when we survey them in a decrease in assets. Let me move on and then um, we'll come back to this. So what I wanna point out is that in these surveys, as I said before, we're not only asking about what assets they have, then we go on to ask what are the risk behaviors you're participating in child or youth, and then we also ask what are the thriving behaviors that you are participating in. So here's the data on the risk, on the risk behaviors. The more assets a child has, which is the green bar, the 31s and over, they are participating far less in the high risk behaviors like using alcohol more than once in the month, using marijuana, skipping school, feeling sad or depressed most or all of last month. The, hot, the low number of asset kids on the red bar, very much more involved in these activities than the kids with the highest number of assets. Who are the kids in red? You may know some of them, I suspect. When the county did this survey in 2004, we were very careful and very methodical about going into the school at Juvenile Hall and serving the kids in Juvenile Hall. And I'll tell you, many of those kids are the kids in red. And look at the asset list. I'll tell you where those kids were significantly diminished in their assets from the rest of the kids in the community. It will not be a surprise. Family boundaries. The kids in Juvenile Hall reported about one third of the kids in Juvenile Hall reported that they had family boundaries made clear to them. Adult role models. The numbers were extraordinary. It was like 6% of the kids in Juvenile Hall said they had positive adult role models in their, in their lives. 50% of kids in the community said they had positive adult role models in their lives. Striking, striking gap. Positive peer influence. Surveyed in Juvenile Hall, the kids told us, my peers are not a positive influence on me, hands down. And then the social competency assets. Restraint skills, resistance skills, and conflict resolution. Again, in Juvenile Hall, the kids in their surveys told us loud and clear, 
I don't have strong restraint skills, I don't have resistance skills, and I'm not good at conflict resolution. I know that. All their developmental asset scores on all those areas were very low. Those are our kids in red. Those are our kids that are hovering around average 10 assets. Other kids in the community have far more. But I'm sure that you all know some of those kids. You might see them in your lives as you travel. Now, we were just talking about this. Although risk taking is normal and the drop in assets is a developmental pattern that we've seen, um, as you'll see in the next slide, it's, it's a natural slide. It's a natural slide in the risk taking behavior. It's a natural increase and then a slide in the risk taking behaviors. And it has to do with where they are in life, their brain development, et cetera. The peak of risk taking behavior we know through the youth development data is around age 17 both for girls and boys. So as they're taking these risks, as they're branching out, as they're pursuing their independence, then that corresponds also to the drop in asset levels. OK, let's talk about the thriving behaviors. The thriving behaviors that are measured in the survey are succeeds in school. And there's a number of questions in the survey. Do you get good grades? Do you try to get good grades, et cetera? Do you value diversity? Do you maintain good health, understand good nutrition, practice fitness and exercise, and how are you at overcoming adversity? Once again, um, you see quite clearly, again, common sense, this shouldn't surprise you, that the kids with the most assets are engaging far more in these thriving behaviors than the kids with the fewest assets, which are the red bars, are engaging far less in the thriving behaviors. This is all self-reported, but I'll tell you once again, when I looked at the juvenile hall survey results, they were all saying by their own hand, regarding the previous slide, yes, I drink alcohol, yes, I smoke dope, yes, I skip school, and no, I don't really care much about succeeding in school, I don't really know much about diversity, no, I don't spend much time exercising or eating well. So I've seen that data, the personal surveys from those kids who have the low levels of assets myself, and it all bears out every single time. So at, let me ask you to think about um, in your, the children in your life, what is a worry that your child has? What is something that bugs them? What is something they are concerned about? Think about that. Who has a good arm? Will one of you take a ball just for a second? OK. And over here, anybody willing to? All right. Sorry. <laughs> Almost got you. And in the middle. Anybody? Got you in the back row. All right. OK. So can the three of you na just name a worry? Any worry? What's the, can you think of a worry that your child might have? how his parents think of him, OK? And maybe that worry might be, gosh, if you get disappointed in me, I don't know what's going to happen, which I would relate to asset number one, family support. Is my family support at risk if I don't pass this test, if I don't make this grade? OK, what about you? Very similar, but uh, higher, high expectations out of yeah. himself. You know? Oh, yeah. You know, having a high bar is very good, but then extremely high, lofty expectations I, I wonder where, where is it going, right? I mean, if right. things don't materialize. Right. So he has high expectations for himself, and how high are they going to get, and what's going to happen if he doesn't make it, and how much is he worrying about that? Right. Okay. And did you have one? Yeah. Yeah, succeeding in school. Succeeding in school is a worry. Okay. Am I going to be successful in school? Am I going to be able to, to do this, keep up with this work, et cetera? Okay. Now, I want you each to take your best chance at throwing a ball at the Jenga tower. <laughs> just do your best. Toss it. At both, all three at so once. Just give it a toss. Get it a toss. Give it a toss. No, just give it a toss. I'm going to try and block. All three at once. Come on. Yeah, yeah, go, go, go. Good. OK. That was good. Wow, you guys are pretty good shots. OK, now, if I could have, can you come down here with me? 
and what is it, Brian? Join me, and would you join me down here? Now take this again. I'm gonna give this back to you. All right, and one more. Do you mind? Okay. Now you guys stand with me. Oh yeah, thank you. Right here next to me. But what if we like them? Now I want the three of you to try to throw the ball at the tower. Go for it. Now, shoot. Three. Bing, bing, bing. Let's go. You can do it. Come on. We're good. We're good. Okay. Cool. Thank you. You guys were awesome. <laughs> did did any ball reach the tower? No. Did the balls hit the tower before? At least one was my count. At least one. Or it bounced off the back and hit the tower, or at least shook the table from the back, right? If our kids are worrying, if our kids have struggles, if our kids are losing assets for whatever reason, they need positive, supportive adults in their lives. Do they need just one? I don't know. I stood up here and tried to protect the tower by myself, didn't do such a good job. When I had three other people up here with me, we did a much better job at protecting that tower. Other adult relationships, asset number three. I cannot overstate the importance of that. We think sometimes as parents, it's all on us. If I don't fix this, she's gonna crash. If I don't make her happy, no one will. If I don't take care of that problem, she's gonna be desolate. We've got other adults in our kids' lives and they are very important. There's a famous developmental psychologist who did most of his research and work in the 1900s. His name was Yuri Bronfenbrenner. He was a German psychologist. And Yuri Bronfenbrenner had a thing he used to say that I've never forgotten, I repeat all the time, which is that he suggested that every child should have five adults who are crazy about him. Every child should have five adults that are crazy about him. And if you look exactly at that asset, number three, other adult relationships, child receives support from adults other than his or her parents. Our kids need loving adults in their lives besides their parents. If it's a coach, if it's a teacher, if it's a grandma, if it's an aunt, if it's a neighbor, it doesn't matter as long as they're there and in and active in our children's lives. Okay, did anybody see where I put my clicker? <laughs> ah, yes, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move on to strategies now. And this, uh, Bill Watterson wrote Calvin and Hobbes comic strip, it's one of my favorites. Can you guys all see this? So um, Calvin's chasing his pet tiger Hobbes through the house making lots of noise. His mom says, Calvin, quit charging around the house. Bang, boom, smash. And she yells at the top of her lungs in utter fury, what did I just tell you? And Calvin says, beats me, weren't you listening either? So basically Calvin's saying, mom, if you're not listening to yourself, why would you ever expect me to listen to you? So I, I love Watterson and Calvin and Hobbes. We read it as a family. So we'll sit, we have the gigantic books, we'll sit down, we'll read, we'll laugh about it as a family, just as a way of kind of coming together. And it can also be a conversation starter. So that's one simple parenting strategy right there is read the comics together. So here's my question to you. What do you do with your kids? What are you doing with your kids when everyone is working to solve a problem together, getting along, talking, having a good time. What are you doing when that's happening? Can anybody tell me what do you think, what is your activity when everyone's getting along, solving problems and talking together? Yeah. We're generally out of the house, outdoors, hiking, going to the beach, doing something. Ooh. So, for you, you're usually out of the house, hiking, doing something um, relaxing. Is that fair? Outdoors then. Yes. Yeah, something outdoors. Somebody else, what is it? What's the last time you can recall where your group of kids or your family or your classroom, whatever it is, was 
really jiving, getting along, solving you're problems, in the and talking. Of it with them. Say it again. You're in the middle of it with them. What's an example of a situation? Well, you're deciding uh, whether to go to uh, whether to go to the to store for Chinese or to go for Italian. And it's a positive thing. Yeah. You're going to go out together, and you're trying to make a decision about that family activity. And everybody's into it. Yeah. Okay. Any others? Yeah. She loves the room. She has a messy room. Yeah. She, I can tell that she's very upset about her room, but she just does not want to do it. Yeah. She refused to do that, but we spent time last weekend, and end up she really enjoyed. She even offered me ah. in the, my room, <laughs> <laughs> and I found that very amazing. Yeah. You did it with her. I did it with yeah. her. Yeah. Yeah. Move into the closets, and that's the way she wanted. She's a nine years old, yeah. struggling to be a teenager. Yes. So I let her decide. Did you hear that? So if you look at, I hear that as um, youth as resources. Asset number eight. Children as resources. I let her decide. Asset number eight, child is included in decisions at home and in the community. We did it together, right? Mom and daughter clean the room together. That right there is family support and positive family communication. It's hard to clean the room together if you're not talking about it, planning it, making decisions together. So that was three assets being built in that activity that went surprisingly well. But, but the, in, in the beginning, yes. it was horrible. We yes. argued. Yelling yeah. Mother, you're so mean. I don't yeah. want to do this. And, and yeah. The end, it's a good so, in the beginning, I'm just going to repeat for the microphone. In the beginning, it was horrible. The room was messy. They were yelling and fighting. But as they came together on the activity, it all worked out and the room got clean. And she enjoyed it and eventually offered to clean your room, which I think is just delightful. Um, the other things I've heard um, going on vacation. So, and I've heard that a lot from families. Wow, everything's going really well for us when we're on vacation. It just reminds me how important it is to take vacations. Because sometimes I get all bogged down in the time and the cost or being away from work. And then I have to remember, wow, being on vacation is often one of those times where all those assets are being built and the family is really clicking and good things are happening. I've also heard um, family meal time. And if you've been paying any attention at all, you all know that family mealtime is a huge um, factor and a big uh, push in s fields of child health and, and positive development, um, especially in this day and age of so much digital media and so many activities all around us all the time, that that preserved family time is really important such that all these things can happen. I've taught, uh, had a family recently say, well, you know, we can never, of four kids, we never can schedule dinner together. The six of us are never together at dinner time, but we have a trampoline in the backyard, and every night before bed, all six of us are on the trampoline. It doesn't matter where they've been, who made it to dinner, what activity, what parent was taken, what child where, by the end of the night, we're all on the trampoline together, we're jumping and then we're lying down and we're talking and we're figuring out how our days were and we're really communicating. So whatever that preserved family time is, is absolutely critical in terms of um, when, when, when families are working it out. Here's another kind of a tip that I've gotten from, um, I believe it was Clay Roberts, who's a nationally known health educator who works strictly in youth development and mostly in prevention uh, among youth um, for drug use and alcohol use and does training throughout the country and different school districts. And um, Clay was the one who mentioned to me that he, he suggests that you always say good night to your child. Every single night, go in there and say good night. Kiss your child good night, tuck them in, say good night. You keep that practice through the teenage years. It is a family ritual, it is a family boundary, in the asset language. It's a rule in the house. We always say good night. That way, as the child becomes a teenager, the child starts driving, he or she is out late at night, maybe he or she is home by curfew, maybe you're asleep, 
the child still comes in to say goodnight to you, even if it's after you've gone to bed. That way you know he's home safe, he's okay, he made it. You started that practice when that child was an infant and you carried it on. It was a family expectation that got carried on. So those are just some of the ideas that I've heard from others. You guys have some good ones. Let's link those to the assets. Yeah. Food preparation for a meal and having the meal together like you mentioned. But yes. actual food preparation. Yeah. Um, yeah. From a very young, I have a three-year-old grandson, and he has been involved in that from a young age, and he cherishes that already. Yeah. Food preparation together. Again, family time, creative activity. Remember the asset around creative activities where you're putting things together and time with family spent doing something productive and contributing to the household. So yeah, meal preparation, that's great. Okay, let's link these, yeah. In, in, when I grew up, there was a huge decision to make when I was helping mother make cookies. Do I put raisins in them, or chocolate chips, or m and Yes. You got to choose in the cookie baking between raisins, chocolate chips, and M&Ms. And that felt good that you got to make that choice. Right, so back to asset number eight, right? Children as resources, excellent. Okay, let's link these back to the assets and talk about some more parenting strategies. So several, we've already been talking about positive family communication, whether it's in the kitchen preparing food, whether it's in a preserved family time, on the trampoline, outdoors in an activity, on vacation, et cetera, et cetera. Positive family communication. Um, I can't stress enough that preserve family time, meal time if you can do it, that that becomes a ritual and an expectation in the family that we all come to the dinner table, no devices, not for anybody, and we sit down at least for 20 minutes and share that meal together. Another thing that I've taken up and I've suggested this to others, especially moms with their daughters, when things get frustrating and it's hard to talk, is a mother-daughter journal. So this is what we do. We have a journal. My daughter decorated it. It's all blank inside. And whenever she feels like it, she writes something in it to me. Whether she's mad at me, whether she's happy with me, it doesn't matter. She writes it down. She leaves it on my bed. I read it at my convenience. I don't have to do anything, or I can respond. Or maybe I'll write down my own thing later. I take the next page. I write whatever I feel like that day or that week or next month. It might be in response to what she said, it might not. Put it on her bed. Then she does the same thing. It comes back and forth. It could be once every six months, it could be once a week. But that's another family communication method that we use. And when I talk to moms who are at their wits end with their daughters or their sons, I say, well, have you tried writing? Well, we text each other, you know, with the soccer schedule, but no, I haven't actually written. Well, you might want to try writing when everything else feels really hard. That's still out there. Um, service to others. So service to others, the Search Institute in their asset research has been focusing lately on really trying to pinpoint which assets in the list of 40 seem to have more boost. And they have found that the asset service to others, which is number nine, has a boost. In other words, if a child is working in the community and serving others, that child is more likely to have a package of other assets attributed to him or her from that asset of service to others. We call it a gateway asset. There are others I can't name them right now, but that's the one that I hear the most about I'm most familiar with. It's interesting to see if that would be a cause due to the other assets right. being in place, or conversely so, doing so then uh, allows those other assets to be imbued upon the child. Right, and they have pretty much determined from their focal look at this that it is that service to others is a causal asset. That service to others, once a child gets engaged in service community, and this can happen, of course, at infancy, toddler age, middle school, high school. I mean, we all know that in middle and high, there may be even requirements for community service, but I'm talking about service that comes genuinely, that the child maybe chooses that is happening out there in the community, whether it's picking, picking a day to pick up trash. As a young child, that's what we used to do when they were really little. 
picking up trash was actually kind of fun with all the proper safety precautions to, um, you know, serving at uh, uh, sh uh, sh serving food at a soup kitchen or a homeless shelter. So those are some of the standards, but there's loads and loads of service that can be done. Service to others, as I said, tends to be what is, is what we call a gateway asset. And that can have huge uh, benefits to kids and open their eyes to things and give them appreciation and help build values in ways that sitting at home having great family communication will never do. So something to keep in mind service to others. Family boundaries. This one is really big. I get a lot of questions about this one today, mostly around technology and use of devices, as you can probably imagine. So when we say family boundaries, we're talking about routines, right? The kiss goodnight every night, the check-in every night, those kind of routines. Family mealtime is part of a family boundary. That's a routine. Clear expectations, having clear expectations for your child. We're talking about maybe a technology contract. That's what I've heard many of my peers talking about with their kids, a written contract when your child gets her first cell phone. What are the implications of that? How are we going to manage this? And often what it comes down to from the folks that I've talked to is, look, we're providing the cell phone to you. We have the rights to that cell phone. At any given time, we will be checking your text messages, your email, and your phone logs. You just need to be OK with that. If you're not OK with that, there won't be a phone. Is that OK? Something like that would be in the technology contract. It could also have, of course, things that are inputted by the child. Well, here's what I'd like to use the device for. Here's what I'm expecting from owning this device now, and having to talk that through as parent-child, but being clear with the communication and the, and the and the technology aspects of it. Uh, parents of teenagers that I know uh, do what they call a parking lot at night, so the teenagers just have to put their phone in a communal family area at night, understanding that the parents have full access to that phone once it lands in the parking lot and it's there all night. So they know that their parents might be looking through things, and it's all been agreed upon in advance. Um, there needs to be agreement about movies, books, video games. And if you aren't familiar already with the um, website Common Sense Media, then I suggest that you make yourself familiar with that. It is by far one of the best websites I've ever seen, and I go to it at least once a week. So commonsensemedia.org is a place where movies, books, video games have been cataloged and reviewed from a youth positive youth development perspective. So you can basically pull up any movie, any book, any video game, and Common Sense Media will tell you what can a parent expect from this book or movie. Does this book or movie have positive adult role models? Does this book or movie or video game feature bad language, consumerism, violence, sexual content? And it'll provide that rating for anything you can possibly think of. So I'm a big fan of that. When you're talking about family boundaries, what's OK for my child, what's not, and why? If I get asked, and this came to light, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Hunger Games, but there was so much chatter when the Hunger Games came out, written by Susan Collins. It's a trilogy about Katniss Everdeen, the arch archer, who eventually takes down a whole um, leadership colony, if you will. And there's a lot of death and destruction and killing kids on kids killing in this in this trilogy. And there was a lot of discussion. This time I had a 9, 10, 11 year old and all the parents were talking about, gosh, this sounds terrible. I don't really want my kid to read it. We uh, went to Common Sense Media first and I take my daughter with me. I say, OK, let's go check Common Sense Media. This is a family boundary. This is a family expectation. We go to this review site before we say yes or no to a book, a video game, or a movie. A couple of other ideas about technology. So in, if you're wondering about guidance, what video games are OK for my kids, uh, what kind of books, what kind of movies, a couple of things that I've been collecting as I've gone along and been paying attention to this whole conversation. One, that it's really important for the adults and the kids to use the media together. If you're worried about a violent video game or you're worried about a violent book, read it together. At least a chapter, a few pages. Play the video game together. If your kid's on Snapchat, sit down on the couch and say, show me. 
Who Snapchatted you last? What are you going to say to this person? Can we send a picture together? What do you want the caption to be? Let's do it together. Second, be a role model. I think as busy adults, we forget this. But if I'm asking my kid to look at me in the face when she's talking to me instead of at her phone, then I need to be doing the same thing. I can't be talking to my child while I'm texting about my next work meeting if I'm expecting her to give me the same respect. So we have to be role models to our kids, especially with the use of devices and technology. Same thing with the preserved meal time. If I say no devices at the dinner table, that means no devices at the dinner table for myself and the spouse and everybody, not just the kids. Watch the clock. We do, it is important to pay attention to how much time is your child spending in front of the screen. Now, instead of setting limits on time, here's another suggestion. You can set expectations. Not limits, but expectations. So, okay, have you been outside today? You need to be outside. Have you finished your homework? Make sure that gets done. Have you had social interaction face to face with another human today? That's important too. These are my expectations. Once you've been outdoors, once you've finished your homework, once you can assure me you've had face to face social interaction with someone, and we've had our family meal time, then sure sit in front of a screen. That's okay, as long as you've met the expectation. So it's your choice, set limits, that's fine too, or set expectations, either one. Yeah. So my daughter, you know, big thing in her middle school classroom is to talk about certain TV shows. So, you know, they'll, she'll come to oh, yeah. and say, okay, everybody's watching this TV show, and I'm like, really? You know, and it's surprising that everyone in that, that classroom is watching that show. So, and maybe I don't think that that's, she's quite ready for that. Um, What's the messaging when you get that everyone is already watching it? What's the messaging when you get, oh, everyone's watching the show, can't I, or can't we, or can I look at it? I would say, let's go see what Common Sense Media has to say about this show. That's number one. Number two is, you know, other families have different rules. We have ours. We all know what these rules are. We're going to stick to them. And... Um, other families have different rules. It's just the way it is. So a couple different things. We get a lot of comments from our kids about what peers are doing, and that's a huge pressure. It's just really important to look at our own values and understand that our family has values. If my family has a value, about vi value around violence, then I'm going to say, sweetheart, we don't watch those kinds of things with violence. We don't watch shows with a lot of sexual content. That's what our values, you know that because we've had that conversation. So following your family values is a great way to bring that conversation back to something that's already been established. Yeah. Uh, a funny thought, um, you always go to Wikipedia and actually look at the plot lines of the episodes and, and just kind of like, well, this is what happened in the episode. If your friends want to talk about this, here's, a, here's an interesting viewpoint on it. Yeah, it can be shocking. Yeah. And, yeah. And to be honest, a lot of Oh, that's a good point. So the suggestion here is to go to Wikipedia and look at the plot line, and you'll get more information. But you're also suggesting that, and this is true, kids are saying they're watching the shows and trying to insert that peer pressure on the others, but they're actually not watching the shows. Or their big sibling is watching the shows. Or mom and dad's watching, so they're not, but they, it sounds cool to say that they are. So they're just saying it. Um, OK, so uh, let's talk, we're going to talk a little bit about building skills. And when you look at the assets around the social competencies, um, a lot of those skills we can build. And as, um, as Clay Roberts has explained to me when I've been sitting in trainings with him, if your child is going to learn to drive, you don't just toss in the keys and say, great, go. Good luck with that, right? You teach the child how to drive. You take the keys, you show the ignition, you tell them how to turn it on, backing out of the driveway, taking turns, using blinkers. We teach them all that stuff before they drive. Well, similarly, let me just use an example. When we talk about resistance skills, that's asset number 35, that is actually a skill that we can teach our kids. Now, if we worry as kids get into middle and high school and are faced with temptations and possible dangerous or harmful situations, there's ways to teach resistance to our kids. And one of the great frameworks that I've seen for doing this 
they're called refusal skills, and I teach this to middle schoolers, is a five-step process. And we'll actually go through it together, and I'll give them a scenario. The five-step process goes like this. I instruct the kids, number one, someone proposes something to you, you're going to ask a question about it. Someone goes on, you're going to name the trouble. You're already hearing, that sounds risky. The person goes on, is trying to tempt, predict a consequence. Number four, this person is pretty important to your child. You're going to suggest an alternative. The child's going to suggest an alternative. And then if the person is persistent, continues to use the peer pressure, come on, you got to go do this with me. Leave, but leave the door open. Here's why I say that, and I'll give you an example. We want our kids to have fun, but be safe, right? So if someone comes up to my child and says, hey, Johnny's going to have a party on Saturday night. Let's go together. What I want my kid to do is say, oh, who's going to be there? That's the question. Who's going to be there? Or what's going to happen there? The person says, oh, you know, his parents are gone. It's going to be great. All of our good friends are going to be there. She says, wow, that sounds like trouble. Things could get out of hand. He says, Nothing bad's going to happen. No one will ever know. Everybody will be out of there by 11. It's going to be fine. She says, I don't know. If coach finds out that I was out late before a game, I could get cut from the team. If there's alcohol being served and the cops show up, I'm going to get grounded for a month. Predict a consequence. I'll get cut from the team. I'll get grounded for a month if, the, if my parents find out. He says, no one's going to find out. It's all set. Bill's house is totally cool. Have you ever been there? It's great. She says, listen, I'm going to watch a movie, and we'll, my parents are going to have a barbecue Saturday night. Let's do that instead. Now, here the peer has been pushing, pushing, pushing. And she's been resisting, resisting, resisting. Now she suggests an alternative. Hey. We're going to watch a movie and have a barbecue. Why don't you come? She starts to push on the pier. The pier says, oh, no, that doesn't sound like fun. Bill's is going to be way more cool. She says, look, I'm going to watch the movie. I'll be having a barbecue at my house on Saturday night. Join me if you want. Send me a text message. She walks away. That person now is the one under peer pressure. That person now has to decide, oh, am I going to join her for the barbecue in the movie, or am I going to go to this party? Now the peer pressure's on him. So this, I just use this as an example of a set of concrete skills that we can transfer to our kids through being with them, through understanding these kinds of things that they can then use to practice their resistance skills. Another asset on the list. All of these, as you well know, planning, our schools do a really good job of working on planning and decision-making skills, at least when they're teaching our kids how to write essays, how to make a speech, how to get ready for a debate, all those kinds of things. Many of these things are taught in school, but resistance skills, in my experience, not so much. Conflict resolution, if you're lucky and you have a school that's focusing on conflict resolution in teams or groups, then your kids are getting some instruction in that, but there are other ways to do that. This is just one example. Okay, to begin to wrap up, I just want to remind you that you have a duty to your kids, and that's going to be, for those of you who have kids, that's going to be your heart and soul, and that's where you're going to be focusing. However, you have a role outside of your family that involves children. And I would argue that the more involved you are and the more intentional you are with other children in the community, the more that's going to build assets in your child. So here's the example. You're a parent. You're probably, if you're a parent, you're a chauffeur. And you're driving not only your kid, but sometimes other people's kids in your vehicle. Therefore, you are that adult role model who is following the rules of the road, who is not texting while you're driving. You're that adult role model in the, in the, in the driver's seat of that car who's talking, asking questions, putting a name on those children, asking them how their day was. You're one of those other adult relationships. You are a neighbor. And so many times, and I've heard this hundreds of times, 
In our communities today, we are so busy, traffic is so bad. When we come home, we just want to drive into that garage, pull the door down, and hope we don't have a neighbor who's going to detain us from what's waiting inside. However, I would say as you're driving down the street toward your driveway, that you roll down your window, and if there's a child playing in the house three doors down, you wave and say hi. And if you have children living on your street and you don't know their names, I would suggest you learn their names. And whether that just means that you drive more slowly down the street with your windows open more often, or if you see someone out playing and they're shooting hoops at the little portable hoop and the ball gets away from them, you just go out and grab it and toss it to them and say, hey. It might just mean writing nice notes at the holidays and dropping them off at every house. If you're a big, Big into this, you hold a block party. Put out flyers, say, hey, everybody, let's just come out into the street on this day. We're going to have some games, and everybody bring watermelon and sandwiches. Those are all the different kinds of ways where I think more than ever, it's important to be connecting in our neighborhoods. Also, that just keeps us more connected with each other. We're watching out for each other. The better we know our neighbors, our neighbors' kids, the more we understand they're going to be watching out for ours as well. You might be a school visitor. You might be a school volunteer. Caring school climate, asset number five. I can't say enough about how important caring school climate is in the lives of our kids. Element, preschool, elementary, middle, and high school. If they don't feel cared for and welcomed at school, school's going to be much more difficult. If you're a visitor to school, if you're a volunteer, I recommend that you take a few moments to meet a couple kids and say their name. At least introduce yourself to your kid's teacher. Make sure they know who you are. Again, it's just solidifying the web of support for your kid. You know the teacher. The teacher knows your kid. You know your kid. You're building a web. To kindergarten, first and second grade parents, at least at my school, the habit is that they, at that young age, they'll walk onto campus with their child. They'll wait in line with their child until the bell rings and the child gets called into class. I always recommend to the parents who are just standing around that they introduce themselves to the other kids in line and learn their names. It takes about 60 seconds. And then when you're back the next day, you try to remember Joshua's name, Jorge's name, and Susanna's name. Use them, say hello, ask them how they're doing. You're an aunt and an uncle, you're a grandparent, you have those kids also where you are gonna be that five other adults one of those five other adults that are crazy about that child. So you want to make sure you're communicating with those kids, communicating with their parent, and creating that web. I'll tell you something that just happened to me this week, and you all may do this. I, I've done this as well. But when my child went off to a soccer dinner with her team, it was time for us. It was at somebody's house. It was time for us to pick them up. We all showed up at the appointed time, 8 PM. And all the parents sit outside now. This is what they do with high schoolers who have cell phones. The parents line up outside the house, and they text their child, I'm here. Come out. Me, because I know all this stuff and I understand the importance of the web of support, I don't touch my phone. I don't care if my kid doesn't want to see me. I don't care if I'm the only person who walks up to that house. I go to the door, knock on it. I go inside, I say, hey, Mrs. So-and-so, thanks for having him. Who are you? Which one of you is the host? Thanks for having him. This is, in this case, I didn't really know any of these girls yet. The season had just started. But I was not going to sit out in the car and text my child because I wanted to be a part of that group. I wanted to put names to faces. I wanted to meet. These are kids that my child is interacting with every day, and I want to get to know something about them. Family support, family boundaries, positive family communication. I'm going to be in that home, getting to know those kids and talking to my kid face to face. In those other roles, um, your other adult relationship, if you're going to be one of those five, think about this. I encourage you to be intentional. Again, if you're going to be on campus for two minutes, just do something different. Reach out, find a name, do whatever it is. One of the interesting things that Search Institute did was they got together with the Gallup polling organization, and they decided that they would poll a couple thousand adults across the country to find out what adults think is important for children to have. 
So the Gallup polling company made these four, it, was four, it ended up being 1,400 calls, and they interviewed these adults, and one of the things they asked was, what are the most important things that adults should do for children? And people came back with all kinds of answers. I think adults need to encourage success in school. I think adults need to teach values to their kids. I think adults need to have meaningful conversations with children. I think adults need to teach how to respect cultural differences. When the poller asked these same people, do you know adults who actually do those things? It was overwhelmingly no. So even though, for example, 77% of the adults polled said, I think adults should have meaningful conversations with kids on a regular basis, 30% said, yeah, I know adults who do that. 77 thinks it's important, 30% do. So the truth of the matter is, many of us know what to do for kids so they thrive, but many of us fail to act. So I think one of the main pieces to come out of this is not only with your own kids to take some of these ideas into consideration, but with all kinds of kids that come into your life to be more intentional, to think about these assets, what are these positive things I'm doing, and to make a go of it that way. All right, so to wrap up, um, asset building results in the accumulation of thousands of moments in time when children and youth feel valued, respected, and known. I described the framework. Once again, pretty common sense. As you go out, you may have already grabbed a list of resources. I've got Common Sense Media listed there. The Search Institute is listed there. And then also our local developmental asset collaborative is called Project Cornerstone. And so I have Project Cornerstone's website also listed there and quite a few materials from Project Cornerstone listed on the outside table. That's the entity, thanks to the YMCA that supports them, that conducts these surveys about every five years of tens of thousands of kids right here in our community so that we have data on our kids that we can use to address the issues in our community. So that's thanks to Project Cornerstone and the Y. Any final comments or questions before we say goodnight? I really appreciate your attention. All right, thank you so much. Go out and build a bunch of assets, that's all I can say.